traditionally rally day is the day that we come back after a summer of loose schedules and vacations and we get ready to kick off a new year of faith formation and to begin again to renew our faith in new and exciting ways. Well, this year's a little different. We're not going to new schedules. We're probably on our same schedules. Um, but we are here and excited about a new year in the church. If you missed Sunday school, our uh, Sunday ser uh, seminar this morning, I hope next week you'll come. It was, it was great. Those who attended seemed to enjoy themselves. Charles did an awesome job. So that is one of the most exciting things that we are doing. And that's part of kind of our immersion into the Book of Acts, which is our faith journey during the next uh, several weeks. So we hope that you find a way that you and your families can enter into that journey and learn from the first century church what it's like to be a church today. Maybe there's messages in there that would be important to us. We really have no announcements today. It's just nice to see you all. It's nice that the weather is good. And so, come. Now is the time to worship. Now is the time to worship our God. Welcome to worship. You 
great to see everyone today. Uh, I'm really glad that you chose to come out and join us. Uh, those of you who were here earlier for our, our beginning uh, Act Seminar, I want to thank you also for coming. Uh, if you didn't get a chance to be here or to join us in on Zoom, uh, please feel free to do that. We're going to meet uh, for the next several weeks at 9.30 uh, in McKeithen Hall, and uh, we're, we're just going to have a really great time together. Uh, the sermon this morning comes from the second chapter of Acts, verses 5 through 13. Let's listen to the Word of God. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in their native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are all not are these not all speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians and Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Amphilia, Egypt and parts of Libya, belonging to Cyrene. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. May God bless to our understanding this reading and hearing of the most holy word. I'm going to try my best to do this. Hopefully, it'll work out all right. Several years ago, this guy named Edwin Keister Jr. wrote an article about a five-year-old boy named Mark Huggins. When Mark was five years old, he asked his mother for a violin for Christmas. Now, Ellie Huggins did not believe that there was any way her five-year-old son could possibly be serious. But Mark kept on asking, and so against her better judgment, Ellie bought a brand new violin for her five-year-old son, Mark. Well, Mark just loved it. Ellie loved it. The city of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania loved it. Today, Mark Huggins is the associate concert master 
for the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra. It's, it's really difficult to know what the future holds, right? I mean, back in January, how many of us would have ever predicted that we would still have to wear face masks and deal with this global pandemic? Right? We like to plan and we like to put prepare and, and those are all really great things but how often do even our best plans get blindsided right it, there's there's so much chaos so much confusion in our world that it's often very easy to settle for less than what god has in mind for us so today we're focusing on an Old Testament prophecy from the book of Joel that Leslie read a few minutes ago. And its fulfillment in the book of Acts that we just read. Both of these passages talk about God pouring the power of the Holy Spirit upon people. You know, it, it talks about young people seeing visions and old people dreaming dreams. It talks about people from all over the world hearing and understanding the gospel message. All right, so, so today we're going to spend just a few minutes reflecting on what can happen when we let the Spirit of Christ Jesus the Lord fill us with visions of grandeur. Before we go on any farther, let's take just a moment and pray together. Let's pray. Great and mighty God, we are here today in the, in the beauty and glory of this morning here uh, outside under the, the umbrella of your beautiful creation, soaking in uh, all the glory that you have set before us. And so as we gather around your word to consider what you might be saying to us today, Lord, open our ears, open our eyes, open our hearts and minds to understand what the Spirit is saying. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So Joel's prophecy was written down about 500 B.C., give or take a few years, about 2,500 years ago. And then 500 years later, 2,000 years ago, people who had known Jesus of Nazareth believed that prophecy was being fulfilled. Uh, they, they had seen and, and worked, been with this man named Jesus of Nazareth for several years, they had truly believed that he was the one God had promised to send their Messiah. This Jesus, they knew, had ministered among first century Jewish people for a few years until he was crucified, dead and buried. On the third day, however, God raised him from the dead. And over the next 40 days or so, Jesus not only appeared to but spoke with the people who had known him earlier and then jesus ascended into heaven and we reflected a little bit on that last week if you remember but but any anyway after jesus ascended into heaven his friends went back to jerusalem and as they were waiting in this in this place together the power of they they experienced a, a, a power so incredible that they became convinced that Joel's prophecy was in fact being fulfilled. The Lord God Almighty was filling them to overflowing with a grand vision of what they could be and do for Jesus. Now all of that happened a long, long time ago in a place very, very far away from here. And that excitement and wonder that those first disciples experienced has ebbed and flowed a great deal over the centuries in the church. But it has not disappeared. That sense of wonder and excitement, that power from the Holy Spirit is just as real and just as available to us. Now, all the events that we read about in the second chapter of the book of Acts took place during what was known as the Festival of Pentecost. Those of you who've been around church for a while have probably heard about Pentecost. We celebrate it every spring as the birthday of the church. 
right? Jewish folks from all over the known world were in Jerusalem giving thanks and praise to God. They were giving thanks for their newly harvested crops and for the law they had received from God on Mount Sinai centuries earlier. And it was during this festival of Pentecost that God acted in a new and powerful way. God poured out the power of the Holy Spirit upon all those who were gathered together. You may be familiar with, with how it sounded like rushing wind and these sparks of fire appeared over everybody's head and they ran out into the streets and they started telling people about Jesus. And everybody out in the street not only heard the words they were saying, they could understand those words in their own native languages. And they were filled with wonder and amazement. There were, of course, those there that day who were skeptical. They accused all these people of just being drunk. And then Simon Peter, their leader, stood up and preached this incredible sermon in which he, he declared that Joel's prophecy was being fulfilled. And when Peter finished that sermon, 3,000 people joined the new movement and the church was born. That's a really high bar that has been set for us contemporary preachers, right? But the reality that was just as real way back then as it is today is that when the Holy Spirit of Christ Jesus the Lord takes up residence in people's lives, He gives them visions of grandeur. And as we allow Jesus' grand visions of what we can be and do for the kingdom of heaven to take over our lives, he will give us a kind of hope that will pick us up no matter where we may find ourselves. He will show us better ways of doing things and he will make us cap more capable than we are ever capable of being on our own. Now, generally speaking, most all of us like to believe that we have a pretty clear vision of what we would like our lives to look like. But the, the thing is that that, that that vision can so easily get blurred by the circumstances we find ourselves in. You know, we do things we're not supposed to do. We don't do things that we are supposed to do. Things happen to us that we cannot explain and do not like. And we start this downward spiral that we really can't do anything about. Well, the thing is that no matter where we may find ourselves, Christ Jesus the Lord is already there. And as we open ourselves to the visions that He has for our lives, he starts to show us the possibilities. So there's this old story about a teenage boy who, who found himself in quite a predicament. He, he was in the 10th grade, and he developed this huge crush on a girl in the 11th grade. But he didn't have the guts to approach her. One day, however, just out of the blue, this girl walks right up to him and asks him to take her to the junior-senior prom. Well, he was just blown over. And without even thinking, he accepted that invitation, rushed out right after school, rented a, to a tux, ordered a corsage, and then realized that his dream had become a nightmare. You see, not only did he not have a car, he didn't even have a driver's license. And all of his friends who did have cars had already made their plans. He had no one to double date with, no way to take his dream date to the prom. But then he remembered that his grandfather had this giant, shiny black car, and he hatched this plan. He walked down to the pawn shop and bought an old chauffeur's hat, and then went over to his granddad and, and persuaded him to put on a black suit and tie, wear the hat, and drive him around as his limo driver, and not to tell anybody that he was his grandfather. Well, lo and behold, 
granddad agreed. And it, was, it worked out perfectly. This young man was, was the hit of the prom. His date loved it. His granddad played the part to the hilt. Right? He drove them all over town, opened and closed car doors with a flourish, and spent the whole night long calling his grandson Mr. Johnson. Granddad was there when he needed him the most. No matter where it is in life, we may find ourselves. Christ Jesus the Lord is there. And if we will simply remain open to the visions that he has in mind for us, he will pick us up and firmly plant our feet on the path God wants us to walk. Along the way, however, our capabilities will start to get in the way. Because right? we so often want to do things the way we want to to do them the way we think they ought to be done. And invariably, we make just a gigantic mess out of everything. As we remain open to the visions of grandeur that Jesus pours out through the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, He will start to show us a better way. There's always a better way. The problem is, we hardly ever know what it looks like. Way back in 1950, the Qtal Manufacturing Company was a soap maker based in Cincinnati, Ohio. And they were looking for a better way to remove soot out of homes that had coal burning stoves. And so they came up with this doughy clay-like substance that worked really well. The problem was that it was about the same time that most all of the homes in the United States were converting from coal to gas. And the company was facing bankruptcy. Joseph McVickers, the company's CEO, then learned that his school teaching sister was using this substance as modeling clay in her classroom. And lo and behold, just like that, Plato was born. In 1943, this guy named Richard Jones was working as a naval engineer. And he was trying to come up with a better meter to monitor the power output in naval battleships. One day he was working with some tension coils when one fell on the ground and when it hit the floor it bounced from place to place to place and without even meaning to Richard Jones invented the slinky. There's always a better way. We can search and we can search and we can search our own resources. But when we open ourselves to the visions of grandeur that Jesus so much wants to give us, we can start to see the best way. There's, there's always a better way. Jesus shows us what's best. So how do we do it? How do we do what is best? That's the catch, isn't it? We can't. On our own, in and of ourselves, we simply cannot ever attain what God has created us to be. We always fall short. We always miss the mark. But that doesn't mean our relationship with God is forever doomed. But as we open ourselves to the visions of grandeur that Jesus wants to give us, we receive the amazing grace and love of heaven and the grace and love that Jesus pours upon us makes us capable of being and doing more than we could ever fathom. There's a bird that's native to the Pacific Island, the Pacific Ocean. It's called an albatross. Maybe you've heard of an albatross before. Back in World War II, sailors nicknamed the albatross Goonie Bird. That's because they look so awkward on land. Albatrosses have up to a 12-foot wingspan. It's the longest wingspan of any living bird. 
and they look so awkward on the ground because albatrosses are actually too heavy to fly. And in calm wind, they can't even take off. But once an albatross is airborne, it is a marathon flyer. Scientists once put a radio transmitter on an albatross to track it. 30 days and 9,000 miles later, the battery was dead and the bird was still out over the open water. Albatrosses just ride along the wind currents. They rarely ever flap their wings. They know that faster wind speeds aloft give them greater speed and when they lose those winds, they, they dive down and let gravity take over their acceleration until they can catch an updraft off a, off a wave. They circle up and begin the cycle all over again. Right? Not only can albatrosses endure some of the most fierce winds at sea, they rarely ever get blown off course. They just circle up above the storm and ride it out until the winds calm down and then they just continue on their way. Nobody knows with any certainty what tomorrow holds. The best we can know is that the Lord God Almighty holds the future in the palm of his hand. Long, long ago, those folks who first knew Jesus opened themselves up to the visions of grandeur that Jesus had for them and the power of Christ's Holy Spirit lifted them above the skeptics and led them on a course in which they accomplished more than they could ever dream possible. As we open up our hearts, our minds, and our souls to the visions of grandeur that Jesus pours out through the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, we will soar. As we give our hearts our minds and our souls to Jesus. He will give us a kind of hope that can carry us through anything that will show us what is best and will make us more capable than anything we could ever ask for or even imagine. And so I invite you today to discover what it's like to ride the wind of the Spirit for the rest of eternity. Amen. We respond to God's word by giving. We give our time. We give our talent. We give our treasures to the work of the kingdom of heaven. The table is set up in, on the sidewalk. If you haven't had a chance to drop anything in yet, if this is your first time uh, with us here at Hydenwood, I I do want you to know that we consider your very presence here as you are offering to God today. Uh, let us worship God in giving our tithes and our offerings. I do want to remind you that uh, next week we, we, will, we will be back inside the sanctuary and we're going to uh, be treated with a special arrangement for variations on Amazing Grace. 
that Jeffrey and John are going to present to us as our message next week. I invite you to come and, and worship the Lord God uh, in a very, very special way. Right now, as we come together uh, in prayer, I invite you to bow with me as we bring the concerns and cares of our hearts, our minds, and our souls before the great and mighty God. Let us pray. Mighty God, in life and in death, we belong to you. We are always accountable only to you. And we trust in your mercy. We take confidence as your children. We eagerly come to be in your presence and to receive your wisdom. When uncertainty swirls around us, we rest in your peace. When the world feels threatening, we find solace in your compassion. When we are overwhelmed by the needs of the world, we remember your power to heal and bring wholeness in ways we can never imagine. When we are afraid that we are alone, you promise never to abandon us. When we yearn to unburden our hearts, you assure us that you hear our sighs that are too deep for words. There is so much on our minds today, Lord. People still recovering from hurricanes and fires and in, and in the path of coming storms. Communities reeling from racial injustice, families grieving the death of loved ones, students, parents, and teachers attempting to navigate a school year like no other. In all the places and with all your people, Lord, bring relief and offer encouragement. We suffer with those suffering from hunger, illness, and loneliness. We rejoice with those who rejoice at the birth of a baby or the beginning of a marriage. We give thanks for the care we receive from friends and the kindness shown to us by strangers. Make of us, we pray, reflections of your goodness and grace to those most in need of your mercy. Hear us now, great and mighty God, as we join together in the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. you all to stand and participate in this one in whichever way other than singing that you uh, <laughs> feel uh, so uh, called to do, so moved by the spirit to do. So whether that be clapping or dancing or making some other sort of uh, uh, sign of your praise to God. So let's just at least stand. <laughs> Shine, Jesus, shine, fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze, set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow, flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word. The light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free by the truth you now bring us. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Praise Set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow. Flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. 
side. Lord, I come to your awesome presence from the shadows into your radiance. By the blood I may enter your brightness. Search me, try me, consume all my darkness. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Place, spirit, place. Set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow. Flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word. Lord, and let there be light. As we gaze on your kingly brightness, so our faces display your likeness, ever changing from glory to glory. Mirrored here, may our lives tell your story. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine, fill this land with the Father's glory. Bless, spirit, bless, set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow, flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. And as you go, may the grace, love, and mercy of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you this day and every day. Amen. Amen. Amen.